In the comments of a recent video, a couple of different people asked about doing a deeper dive on altered chords. So this is my attempt at unpacking what I understand about altered chords. So what is an altered chord? Now I'm not certain that there's a definitive answer for this. The funny thing about modern music theory, I could probably do a whole separate video just on this. The funny thing about modern music theory is that it's quite common that different musicians will have a slightly different definition of what constitutes something. And chords is a really common one. You may well have seen major seven chords written in a bunch of different ways when they all mean exactly the same thing. So what I'm saying is an altered chord may mean something slightly different to one musician than it does to another. But I'll come back to that in a bit. Fundamentally, an altered chord is a type of dominant seven chord. Now, I've made a few videos now about dominant seven chords. That's because they're quite special, hence my video, What's So Special About Dominant Seven Chords. So there might be a little bit of repetition from those videos in this as we talk about altered chords. You see, you can have a bit more fun with dominant seven chords more than most other chords. They can take on disguises and different uses and functions, but at the heart of it, they're all about creating tension. Tension and release, it's all about tension and release. In fact, I think all music is about tension release to some degree. We have our key center or our home base, and nearly every song ever is about taking us away from there, waiting for us to eventually come back home. It's like stretching out an elastic band, building in tension as we move away from our home base before releasing and returning. So a dominant chord, dominant seven chord, or a five chord, or a seven chord, whatever you want to call it, is built from these intervals. A root note, major third, perfect fifth, and a flat seven. Now fundamentally, these notes together don't feel resolved. Agree? Feels like they're lingering in the air waiting to be resolved. To C maybe. flat maybe. But why is this? A major seven chord doesn't have the same quality. It feels resolved on its own. And the same for a minor seven chord. It doesn't feel like it's pulling us anywhere. So the reason is the intervals of a dominant chord create a dissonance that those other chords don't have. Throughout a major seven chord and a minor seven chord, there's a consonants that runs through their intervals. But a dominant seven, there's an interval between the third and the seventh, which is a tritone, which isn't very pleasing to the ear, which creates this tension that wants to be released. Okay, does that all make sense? You following along? Am I ever gonna start talking about altered chords? Yes, but first back to our tension and release. Tension and release, dissonance and consonance, are used in all music. But different styles of music use it differently. Making videos about different areas of music theory, you realize that certain things you talk about aren't always very relevant to all styles of music. Now, the areas of music theory that I study tend to be directly linked to the type of music that I play. And I've been lucky enough to play a fairly broad range of music. All my experience has been across a broad range of what I would call modern music. So pop, rock, jazz, gospel, blues, funk, electronic, uh, singer-songwriter. Um, I've never really had much experience in the classical realm. Where was I going with this? Oh yes, um, altered chords are really frequently used in music of black origin. So jazz, gospel, soul, R&B, hip hop, but you don't really find them used much at all in pop or rock or um, electronic or folk or sing acoustic singer songwriter. So where you might find these altered chords in these styles of music, what they like to do is to really accentuate that tension before the release, that dissonance before the consonants. So finally, what are altered chords? They're dominant seven chords with chromatic extensions. So what are chromatic extensions? Well, extensions are extra chord tones that we can add to our basic chord. When we first build a chord, we build up in thirds from the root note using the notes from the key that we're in. So G7 is the fifth chord in the key of C. So, so the key of C 
is the notes we have. So let's build our G7 chord up. We start on our G and we move up in thirds, which is just skipping one note. And we add our note, which is the third of the chord because it's the third note of the scale. And then we can do move up a third again. And we add our fifth because it's the fifth note of the scale. And then we can do it again, move up a third, and we've got our G7. So that's the core of our chord. Now we could keep doing this in the same fashion, adding on thirds, and these extra notes that we get here are our extensions to the chord. So after our seven, we also have our ninth, eleventh, and thirteenth. These notes are our extensions to a G7 chord. Now those are extensions, but an altered chord uses chromatic extensions. So what does that mean? So chromatic extensions are notes that are a semitone away or a half step away from our diatonic extensions. So for example, our A, which is the ninth of a G7, our chromatic extensions from an A could be a sharp nine or a flat nine. For our 11th, we could have a sharp 11, although we wouldn't have a flat 11 because a flat 11 would just be the same as the third. And then our 13, we can have a flat 13, but again, we wouldn't have a sharp 13 because a sharp 13 would be the same as our flat seven that we already have here. So the chromatic extensions on a G7 chord would be flat nine, sharp nine, sharp 11, and flat 13. You may often hear the flat 13 referred to as a sharp five. Uh, and sometimes you might hear the sharp 11 referred to as a flat five. They're just enharmonic equivalents, which is a fancy way of saying that they're the same note. Sharp 11 is the same as a flat five. So I think my first understanding of altered chords was that they were a seven chord with a sharp nine and a sharp five, or flat 13. My root note, and I've got my third and seventh, and then a sharp nine and a sharp five. And the name of the altered chord came from the altered scale, which is the seventh mode of the melodic minor. So a G altered scale is that which comes from a flat melodic minor. So you can see the intervals of a G altered scale contains the root note. And then the flat two and the sharp two, which is the same as the flat nine and the sharp nine. And then a third, and then a sharp four, or sharp 11, and then a sharp five or a flat 13, and then a flat seven, and the root again. So my voicing for a G altered includes the third and seventh, and then includes the sharp nine and the sharp five. Back to what I was saying earlier about people calling different things the same name or the same thing different names. So although I tend to play and used to think that an altered chord was just a sharp nine and a sharp five, I think it's pretty common that an altered chord is interpreted as a dominant seven chord with multiple chromatic extensions. So not just a sharp nine and a sharp five, but it could be a flat nine and a sharp five, or it could be flat nine and a sharp 11. And that's because all of those extensions, whichever way you play them, all of those notes are going to fit into that altered scale harmony. So whatever you're playing. Just to make things more confusing, the altered scale is sometimes known as the super Locrian scale and also sometimes known as the diminished whole tone scale called the diminished whole tone because the first half of the scale looks like a diminished scale and the second half of the scale is like the whole tone scale. Diminished whole tone. So you might hear these referred to under those names. Yeah, I know. So where, when, how can you use these chords? Well, one of the most common times that you'll see one of these altered chords being used is in a minor 2-5-1. A typical minor 2-5 will be um, half diminished on the 2 chord, minor 7 flat 5 on the 2 chord, and then an altered chord for your 5 chord, followed by a minor 7 for your 1 chord, or sometimes a minor 6, or sometimes a minor major 7, but probably most commonly a minor 7. 
Now there are charts that will have a minor 251 where the 5 chord is just written as a dominant 7 chord. Now you can always get away with turning that into an altered chord. Now actually you won't very often see an altered chord written on a chord progression or a lead sheet. It's usually at the discretion of the player as to where and when you play them, as to where and when you might turn a regular 7 chord into an altered chord. So although an altered chord is commonly used as the 5 chord in a minor 2-5-1, does that mean it can't be used in a major 2-5-1? Will you tell me? I like it. I think it works. Within a certain context, obviously. As we said before, music styles like jazz like to accentuate that tension. And even within jazz, there are certain styles of jazz that like to accentuate that tension more than other styles of jazz. I talked before in my video, what's so special about dominant chords, about how we have this sort of liberty with any dominant seven chord to add a bit of chromaticism in. Sometimes you might just want to keep it subtle and maybe just add a, a flat nine in there, or just add a flat 13. But then there might be some times where we want to add the whole sort of chromaticism through everything in there. Or you could use them as a nice device to build the tension. So you play a normal seven chord, and then you play the altered chord to build that tension before the release. I think the more that you experiment with things, the more that you'll find the ways that you feel most comfortable playing with them. I'd encourage you to try adding some of this tension to your dominant chords with an altered voicing and see how you like it. Another way that I like to implement the use of altered chords is sticking them in on the fly to add a bit of colour and interest as the five chord of whatever our target chord is. One of the most common ways that I'll use this idea is on tunes where you're staying on a chord for a long time. I'm sure we've all played those funk tunes or those Latin tunes where we've been sat on a minor seven chord for what feels like an eternity. So a, a way to add a bit of interest is just before, just to add that altered chord in to bring some colour. And that's the same thing for your soloing. This doesn't need to be something that the rest of the band are doing it. it can be something that you do it works really nicely if you're improvising so you're on that chord for a long time and you want to add a bit of interest reference that altered scale before coming back to your one so just add that in every now and again Sounds really nice. So rather than constantly sticking on that minor seven tonal center, you're just adding a little bit of interest by occasionally going to the altered chord, which is pulling you anyway to resolve to the one. So you're adding a bit of interest. to then resolve back to the chord that everyone else is already on. So they can work a bit like tritone substitutions and secondary dominant chords where that even if they're not written in the arrangement, you can slide them in because what they're doing effectively is pulling the listener to the next chord. So they can be really useful and add a nice bit of color. Okay, so I hope that's been helpful. Like I said before, I've already made a few videos on dominant chords and different aspects of them and different types. So please check those out if you haven't already. Uh, thanks for being here.